right. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be continuing our urban permaculture speaker series um, with just various people that are experts in topics that um, we think are important to build a kind of place literacy and um, help us connect more deeply to the land and to ourselves and to our purpose and how we can contribute. And so um, Matt and I are co-instructors for the Urban Permaculture Design course that is run through a small nonprofit called City Repair. Many of y'all are very familiar to us, so it's, it's sweet to see some familiar faces and see some new ones. And um, tonight we have, well, it's looking bright, um, but it's, yeah, this evening <laughs> we have um, a guest from our uh, Portland City Water Bureau, Briggy Thomas. And I'll just share a little bit about how I chanced upon Briggy. Uh, I'm working on a different water bureau led project that's pretty unique. It's up in Mount Tabor where I'm currently a resident. And it's, um, it's a signage project that will be uh, bringing into focus the indigenous story of water. And so I've worked with um, some of these incredible urban indigenous community members in this area on various like uh, public land management and um, healing justice and biocultural restoration, like just so many different ways to um, think about it and um, met a colleague of Briggy's through that. And um, in discussion, as we were um, talking about things, I was like, hey, you know what? I don't really understand our water system. And as a permaculture designer and also as a citizen, I think it would be really helpful for me to understand how things work. I, I know I've heard bits and pieces about some elements that make our system unique to us. So then um, uh, the person at, at the Water Bureau um, he then just put me in touch with Briggy, said this is our uh, community education person um, who will be able to explain things. And so, you know, um, reached out to Briggy. Briggy was like, I really want to meet some people, talk to some people. COVID's been strange. There's no like tours that uh, Briggy's been able to really um, lead. And so we were like, you know what, let's throw together an event and meet some folks and talk about water and our connection to um, to the watershed. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to you, Briggy, where Matt and I are here on standby at any point if you need any support. And um, really excited to have you with us. Thank you for, for agreeing to um, speak to us. Thanks, Reedy. Thank and Matt, thank you so much for having me tonight. And thank you to all of you who showed up. I know that you might be in all kinds of different places, but um, it's we're just out here tonight. So anyone who showed up to be on a screen, I really appreciate your enthusiasm about water because I can't imagine why else you would be here tonight. So, um, so I've been working at the Water Bureau for 23 years this month. So it's been a really long time. I've been running the education program, which is um, just an amazing joy to get to teach kids and adults. I mean, it's been, you know, little little kids but mostly third grade and up all the way up to I think 95 years old I've taken into the Bull Run watershed and um, we have a really amazing water system here in Portland and water is just such a basic everyone needs it but it's so easy for us not to have to think about it and we've been struggling at the Water Bureau realizing that over the years we sort of decided that like, if people don't know about us, that means we're doing our job, right? Because the water just comes out of the faucet and they don't have to think about us. And we're, we're now realizing that is, we've done a little bit of a disservice that people should be more connected to their water and where it comes from and what it takes to get it to their faucet. And um, you know, if they're fortunate to have a faucet because there's plenty of places in the world that don't have that. So. Um, so anyways, it's a really fun thing that just feels very simple, but so important. And that's what I get to do all the time. Um, I also do some work on cultural resources for the Water Bureau, which has to do with both historic preservation and tribal relations. And just want to acknowledge as we start, we are all in lots of different places, it seems. Um, I'm in Northeast Portland, Oregon, but um, wherever we are, we are all um, in the U.S. at least residing on land that was... Um, you know, has for time immemorial been 
the home of lots of different peoples and the city is taking on a pretty cool um, effort to create a land acknowledgement guidebook. So we've actually been instructed not to do a land acknowledgement specifically until we have that guidebook, but trying to make sure that we are doing a good job of appropriately representing those peoples and doing that respectfully. And um, so I look forward to when we have that, but just like to mention that we are in the process on that. And then I would love to just know who's here tonight. And I would love to know your name. I understand if you're camera shy, that's totally fine. But if you are willing to just, you know, give us a little flash of yourself, I'm a people person and I'm used to being, you know, on a bus with 25 people at a time. And, um, you know, it's just people, I tell my 16 year olds, good to be human with humans. So I'd love to be human with you humans um, as much as you're willing. And so if you're willing to everybody, I don't know how we want to do it. I can only see three of you on the screen, but we could take turns just telling me your name, where you are located right now. Um, if you happen to know what your watershed is, you could do that. Um, I'm in the Willamette River watershed and, um, and, and what your favorite thing is to do with water. Um, that would be awesome. And if there's something burning that you're like, this is why I came tonight, let me know what that is and I'll see if I can address it. Uh, maybe Jen, do you want to start? Sure. My name is Jen Forti and I live on Mount Tabor. I always assumed we were the born, I mean, I've always assumed we were just feeding off of one watershed. That's why I'm here, because I'm <laughs> educate myself about water, the watersheds. So I, I bull run, I don't know. Um, and my favorite thing to do with water, um, I'm a performer, so I like to gargle sing. Yeah. <laughs> sing with, with wild gargling. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jen, you are not in the Bull Run watershed. I can guarantee okay. you that on Mount Tabor. <laughs> Uh, yours is complicated because we uh, put a bunch of those rivers underground many, many years. You know, we kind of buried the natural streams in a lot of Southeast. So it's pretty, Matt may know a lot about that. But anyways, we'll, we'll get into watershed. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. How about, um, is it Lori? Hi. Yeah, I'm Lori Bennett. Um, I go by Lori Ann now because I moved to Columbia Eco Village and there's a Lori already here and um, oh my gosh. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not really positive of what, I mean, I'm on the Willamette, but I'm also close to the Columbia. So you're right. I don't know. I, I moved here last year. Um, I'm here because I really travel. I grew up playing the creeks and stuff back east, but I've now lived from all a bunch of places in Alaska all the way to Southern California. And I was down there in the drought for six years and I've climbed to some and hung out with a lot of climbers who also record stuff with glaciers. And so I've been really watching things for decades when nobody would even believe stuff. And so I really understand, I, I watch Mount Hood and I, been just very concerned and so doing what it, what we can there's a lot of um rainwater here and above ground cisterns and but this is just one little place so however i can help awesome thank you laurianne Lori laurianne um how about rod Can't hear Rod. Can you guys hear him? Rod, you'll have to take yourself on mute. How's there that? you go. Good. Awesome. Didn't hear me burp later earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, I live here with uh, Connie Van Dyke, which some of you may know, uh, Mount Tabor's or, uh, area, South Tabor, uh, Tabor Tilt Farm, actually. <clears throat> um, I assumed Bull Run was our watershed, <clears throat> but I'm not sure and uh, interesting to know. Um, I come from a background of farming in British Columbia, where if you wanted water, you drilled for it and you used it and you took your chances. Sometimes you went 100 feet, sometimes you went 300 feet, and sometimes you went dry after spending a lot of money. So um, 
I don't take the water here for granted. We don't drink our tap water, which would be an interesting topic to hear tonight because we just don't trust it. Uh, we don't like additives. We get our water from the spring on the way to uh, Cannon Beach where we have a, a small cabin. Um, prefer it right out of the creek, so to speak. <laughs> but I'm here because um, I can't live long without water and I like to have backups to backups. And I enjoy collecting about a thousand gallons every year here and I'm watching the crow drink out of the the pond behind me there and uh, we're always mindful of the bees and have water all over the place for them and um, water is important so that's why I'm here. Awesome thank you so much yeah I probably should have clarified I don't know if people are answering the watershed their water comes from because yes that might be Bull Run but um, I was thinking more where you live but um, we can answer that in multiple ways. Um, okay, so I see Nancy now. Hi, I'm happy to be here. I um, used to know for sure where I used to know where what watershed I was in. I think it's Johnson Creek, but I have completely forgotten that. Um, I like to play in water. I like to learn about water. Um, I like to garden and I care a great deal about it and I'm worried about it. And um, I think that is all I have to say. Thank you, for, thank you for this very much. Thanks, Nancy, that's great. Um, let's see, can you all see, let's see, I'm trying to figure out who else we have here. Oh, there we go. Um, Sean, I see Sean. Hi everybody. Yeah, I'm just working on my computer, so I don't have my camera on. But um, uh, yeah, I um, I I kind of have lost the original question, but I think I get the gist of it. Um, you know, I you know my favorite thing to do with water is, is just to do rain hikes. Like all my favorite hikes, like and the most spiritual moments I've ever had, for some reason, always happen on these really weird like fall, spring, winter hikes. Um, one of the most important ones in my life was out at Opal Creek, actually, which is really sad because it's burned down now. But um, we just got like this like spring storms, just this massive series of storms rolling through and then we get sun. Um, so you get that crazy like solar uh, like light effect of like all of the water still running down the, the trails and stuff like literal streams everywhere. The whole ecosystem's underwater and all the trees and conifers have droplets all over them and it's all just reflecting with light and um so anyway it's my favorite thing for water and then uh yeah i kind of understand the water system but like most people i assume that they recharge everything from bull run for the most part so if i'm wrong about that i'll i'll be learning something awesome thank that was a some pretty beautiful imagery i love that um Okay, so what we're gonna do is I, I just have technically 27, but really about 15 slides and they're mostly photographs. And I wanna take you on kind of a visual tour of the system. The reason I have so many extra slides is because I have the map of our system intersected between the photographs. So we can kind of jump from, you know, here's the whole system and now we're gonna go to this spot and then we'll be able to kind of keep taking ourselves down the path. So I'm used to doing you know, when we get past this uh, strange world that we're living in right now, um, I would love to take all of you on a tour. Um, we have public tours that we do every summer and early fall, and you can sign up on our website, and it's a full day. You kind of have to commit for the day, but it is super worth it. It is a beautiful place, and um, and I can I can talk for eight hours about this stuff. So um, be careful. We've only got, you know, 45, less than that now. So, um, so anyways, I'm going to give you little snapshots of, you know, kind of just to give you a sense of the overview of the system. And then we've got some questions that Reedy posed and, you know, any questions that you all have, if I'm not the person to answer them, I can direct you to any one of my colleagues who can dive really, really deep. I know a little bit about a whole lot of things 
And then I know a lot of people who can take you really deep. So be careful what you ask for. Um, so I am going to start. I think, are we ready to share my screen? We're ready to go? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So Here we go. Okay. We're going to start out way of Portland public human water system extends out beyond the city of Portland limits. So what we're looking at on this map are, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Does my cursor show up when I go like that? Yes. Around yes. Around the white area. Okay. So this, the white section is what we call our distribution area. So everyone within this white area drinks water from Portland's water system. Portland's water system the water comes from two different sources. Mm. That is either right here, the Columbia South Shore well field. So a well field being a big area of land in which we happen to have a lot of wells. We have about 25, what we call production wells. We have lots of other kinds of wells too, because we have test wells and monitoring wells to make sure that the groundwater, you know, we basically test the groundwater, monitor it to make sure it's safe and mm -hmm. um, before it gets to the production wells. And then over here, the other green is the other source, the Bull Run watershed. So that is the primary source. Bull Run is the, you know, the most well-known um, and we've been using it by far the longest. We have started using Bull Run in 1895. So we've been using this water for a good long time. Um, we've been using groundwater since the mid eighties. So, um, but if we wanna go, let's see, so this, I'm gonna make sure I orient you to everything here. We've got the Columbia River, which you're all probably pretty familiar with, the Willamette River flowing to the north into the Columbia. The Bull Run River is a tributary of the Sandy River, which also flows into the Columbia like the Willamette. So we're part of the Columbia River system and the Sandy River system. Um, just because we talked about watersheds, so when we take our kids, the students that we take on tours, we do a thing where I make them repeat after me and we do hand motions and we say, a watershed is an area of land where water flows to a common point. And so this green area right here is the Bull Run watershed, it is the portion of the watershed that collects into our drinking water system. And there is, there are six miles of Bull Run River right here that you see from the bottom of dam number two out to the Sandy River. So it's most of the watershed, but then the Bull Run watershed is part of this bigger Sandy River watershed, which includes the Zigzag River watershed, the Salmon Creek watershed. So, you know, all these things branch, it's like a tree, um, and all being part of this larger Columbia River watershed. So we're kind of all in the Columbia River watershed, right? But some of us are more specifically Um, so in Portland buys water from the city of Portland, they serve it to their own customers. We have Tualatin Valley, Valley Water District over here and a you know a bunch of other smaller um, jurisdictions and water districts that buy water from us. So all told, there's about a million people who drink this water. And it is, like I said, generally coming from the Bull Run, but there are two times where we would use groundwater. And that would be either in the summertime, as we all know, it gets beautiful and sunny and, you know, I happen to think it's pretty beautiful when it's wet and green too. So, I mean, us real Oregonians, we, I'm not even from here originally, but, you know, if you like the rain, then you get to, you know, maybe claim that a little bit. So, um, you know, it's, it, but it gets sunny, it gets warm and our rivers get low. And the Bull Run River is one of those rivers that gets low. And we try to store some of that water and we're gonna show you how that all works. But 
sometimes it's not enough and we need to lean a little bit on groundwater to make sure that we have enough water both for all of these million people and for the aquatic organisms and specifically the Endangered Species Act listed fish that live in the Bull Run River that we have to make sure we are continuing to provide water to. So, um, so we use it to supplement in the summertime. And then one of the other unique things about Bull Run is we do not filter, physically remove anything from the water currently. We are working right now until 19, or until 19, we're past that one, 2027 to build a filtration system. Um, but we don't have that and haven't had it since the beginning, 1895, when we started this water system. So, um, so this watershed, if we were to ever get, let's say a major rain on snow event, which can happen in the winter time, we could get sediment stirred up in the river and we would have no way to remove it. We call that a turbidity event. If that were to happen, we can turn off Bull Run completely and we can turn on this groundwater system and run on it entirely. So these million people in the winter time consume about 80 million gallons of water a day. Our groundwater system can supply between 85 and 100 million gallons a day. For a sustained period of time, it would be in the lower end of that. Um, so we can provide all of our needs with groundwater when we have to, um, but typically, like I said, we're getting it from Bull Run. So we, um, let's see, any questions about this map? We're gonna see it a bunch, so you'll have other opportunities, but um, we're gonna start, I'm basically gonna take you up to the upper, like the northern, the northeastern side of the Bull Run watershed. And you can kind of see, can you see Mount Hood over here? This little asterisk. Okay, so we're gonna go up sort of towards Mount Hood and we're gonna take you to the headwaters and we're gonna follow the water downstream. That's how we like to do our tours. And so I'm gonna do my virtual tour the same way. Um, if you have any questions, just, you know, kind of turn yourself off mute and this is super informal can just holler out and say, Brigitte, I have a question. Um, okay, so we're gonna take our first, there we go. Okay, so our first slide is just taking a look here at Mount Hood. This is not precisely um, in the Bull Run watershed, but it's out that way and out towards Mount Hood. And just to give you, this is even after we've already developed the system, but just to, you know, it gives us a good little bit of imagery about kind of the wildness of the Pacific Northwest and what it took for people to go out and figure out that a place like this was a good place to get drinking water from. Now, um, basically when Pioneers started settling, you know, coming out, um, you know, from the East Coast, from the Midwest, and settling the West. They essentially were looking for, you know, they were needing to be pretty connected to their resources. They had to understand where they're going to get their water from, where they're going to get their food from, how they're going to find shelter. And so they settled in what is now Portland um, for lots of reasons, but including, you know, there are all these great big trees. We became known as Stumptown for all these trees that got cut down and used for all kinds of things. They got used for houses. They got used for, you know, I'm, you're looking at the wood of a 1898 Portland home. Um, so use some of that Douglas fir and um, they used it to build, you know, there were wooden plank roads. We had water pipes that ran water through the city of Portland that were made out of Douglas fir trees with two inch holes drilled down the center of them. And that's how water ran around the city way back in the, you know, mid 1800s up until the, um, you know, up until Bull Run began. And we tied into that wooden water main system when we started using Bull Run water. So we had um, essentially people, the population of Portland was growing and people were using the Willamette River for drinking water supply. So they were pumping water out of that really plentiful river that was right there in their backyard, maybe their front yard. Um, but unfortunately, we also started using that river for the disposal of waste. And there was, you know, a pretty false idea that the river flows downstream and takes that stuff with it. And unfortunately, that's not true, as I think probably most everyone on this 
Paul is aware of, um, that we um, were essentially starting to have waterborne disease problems. Um, so people drinking that water from the Willamette River started getting sick. And we had a lot of Portlanders that were getting typhoid fever, they were getting cholera, and people were dying. They were getting really sick and they were dying. And a bunch of people got together and said, we think we need a new water system um, to make sure that water is healthy, that the water keeps people healthy. Now, this is, it's complicated, right? Because unfortunately, so I'm gonna tell you this story about this great place that they went out and surveyed and said, look, this is a place we can set aside, we can protect it. Um, unfortunately, they chose that instead of saying, maybe us humans and particularly white settlers can stop behaving in the way that is causing this river to be polluted. And so I want to acknowledge that that's a real, that's a real thing. That's a choice we made. And so at the same time that I can say, wow, look at the foresight. We are one of the only cities in the US and probably the world that has a watershed that is this protected, that is this, um, you know, untouched. And it's not untouched, obviously, we have some massive dams in the river, but, um, but comparatively, relatively untouched, um, but it does mean that we chose that and we now have a super fun site in the river in the middle of our city. So, um, so I don't want to leave that unsaid. Um, yet, want to go on with some passion about what is exciting about Bull Run. So we're going to, we have these surveyors who went out and they came back and said, the Bull Run watershed is the place to get our drinking water. They had some pushback from the governor who said that water that you see in that picture from Mount Hood, glacial melt, is the, the statement was that it was going to cause goiter to the fair sex. And it turns out, um, you know, we'll leave the fair sex part alone, but the goiter part was also wrong. They, um, there, there was this impression that goiter was caused by glacially fed water systems. And I am not gonna remember the history and the science behind why they thought that, but it's not true, goiter being an iodine deficiency. But what they had to do was actually go out and prove to the governor that gosh, no, there is this watershed, there's a ridge line all the way around the bull run and water off of Mount Hood can't flow down and then up the other side because we all know water doesn't flow uphill unless you put it in a pipe and you push it up those pipes. But anyway, so there is no Mount Hood runoff in the Bull Run watershed, which is something that many people don't know and misinterpret. And the Oregonian often over the years has misrepresented this. And part of it is our fault because we put Mount Hood in every picture we have of the Bull Run watershed. So, um, so they went out and finally they convinced the governor, yes, this is not coming off the glaciers. They worked out whatever political you know, issues were going on with him wanting not to develop the Bull Run system. And, ultimately started building it in 1892. So um, we are now, let's see. So we are going to end up up here, this black line that you see around the Bull Run watershed and you see a black line around the Columbia South Shore well field that represents protected areas. Now, what a protected area means for our well field and what it means for Bull Run are very different. The protected area for Bull Run, we call that area within the black line. It's called the Bull Run Watershed Management Unit, which is quite a mouthful full and very bureaucratic, but it is 147 square miles that is closed to the public. No one is allowed in there unless you come on one of our public tours or you happen to work for one of the agencies that is responsible for the watershed. Um, in the Columbia South Shore well field, the protection area is really just that we have rules and regulations that businesses need to follow that operate within that area. And then we do kind of voluntary education with the public about what we can do to protect groundwater. So we're gonna go inside that black line here. Um, so our next slide is basically looking at that far Southeast side of the watershed. And we're at one of the 14 gates that surrounds the watershed. The roads into the watershed have, um, have these gates. And I will say, um, you'll catch me regularly saying the watershed. You all, we all live in a watershed. There's way more than one watershed. And it's just in my world, the Water Bureau's world, the Bull Run is the watershed. So it's, um, I'm not proud that I, that comes out of my mouth so much, but, um, but this watershed 
we're going to go in. Um, this is a road that travels all the way through and it's going to wind up and eventually get to the river and then it's going to follow the river all the way down. So, um, so now we're going to go up the, we're going to kind of wind through here. We're going to end up uh, actually as we're, as you're winding and looking, we're gonna, what you're gonna notice is that this whole green area, this is 102 square miles of land that is capturing that water for us. And so what is often interesting to people is people this time of year are saying, oh my gosh, the snow is melting. What are we gonna do? We're not gonna have enough water this year. And it turns out that this is what we need. So, um, you know, so we had that beautiful story about the, you know, rainy hikes, and we've definitely had plenty of those days out in Bull Run. So the good fortune here is that we don't rely as much on, because we're not getting that water off of Mount Hood, we're not as dependent on snow. We do get snow in the upper part of Bull Run, but we're not as dependent on it. So we really, all we, we really care about spring rain. And so we definitely are kind of waiting, like, we love this beautiful day, but like when, when's the rain going to come? We want it to keep raining into June because that's what helps us make sure we still have enough water in the watershed to get through, get us through the summer. So we are, Portland gets an average of, you know, there's lots of people say 36, 40, you know, there's a lot of um, different stats that people will share, but around, you know, 36 to 45 inches of rain a year in Portland, Bull Run averages 135. So it is a legitimate rainforest. Um, we have places all the way up in the kind of northern and uh, western, or eastern parts of the watershed that will get up to 170 to 180 inches of rain a year. So we can catch some rain, which is really awesome. It's big difference from even say the west side where you have people capturing water for water systems on the west side, you know, the Willamette Valley and their rain situation is very different. So how, you know, short periods of dryness can affect them is really different. Um, so we're really fortunate about that. So again, we're still kind of generally looking within this bull run watershed and we're gonna now, all that rain lands in this forest. We have um, a little over half of this is still untouched old growth forest. So I'll say untouched, which is not, that's a, that's a pretty um, white colonial perspective on that. But, um, but basically there hasn't been major logging in this watershed, um, in this 50 plus percent of this watershed. Um, there was about 25% of the watershed was logged by between the Forest Service and then the Water Bureau, some for the clearing of reservoirs, um, logged about 25% of the watershed. But since 1993, logging has been prohibited. And there's been a lot of a long history of um, controversy and community activism around stopping that logging in Bull Run. And so now we have the only trees that can be cut down is for the management of the water system and, you know, whether it's um, clearing for pipelines or, you know, making sure that those pipelines stay clear, um, safety issues, things like that. Um, so there's some really gorgeous Western red cedar, western hemlock, Douglas fir, primarily in most of the watershed, some low elevation old growth forest that is, you know, was easier to, you know, get to and therefore cut and so is a little bit harder to come by. Um, but this is the Bull Run River traveling through all this rain is collecting and it's collecting into, you know, what is this really spongy old growth forest um, floor system that is essentially a bunch of storage for us, which when we talk about these reservoirs that we're gonna see in a minute, um, I'll give you some stats on how much water this forest can hold. It's pretty impressive. So that rain is falling into the forest and um, now we are gonna work our way down. We saw the river and we're gonna work our way down the bull, sorry, my cursor, down the Bull Run River. So we're gonna be, in these little tributaries, water's collecting through the forest and then all the way down the main stem of the river. Here is the main stem of the Bull Run River. And again, you can see that it is forested right down to the river. It's um, some, pretty, some pretty clear water. I know um, Rod was talking about, you know, he trusts it better to take it right out of that spring. And I, um, 
I can completely appreciate that. Um, we do always tell people, you know, you really want to know what's upstream of where you're scooping it out. So if it's coming straight out of the ground, you're good to go. Otherwise, you want to make sure there's no animals that are um, pooping in the water upstream of you because there can be Giardia, Cryptosporidium, things like that in the water. But um, but far as that goes, Bull Run, I tell the kids, if you were in a zombie apocalypse and you decided you could escape to Bull Run, you probably could drink the water, but um, technically we have to treat it before we can give it to you just to make sure that bacteria and viruses aren't gonna, aren't gonna hurt you. So we're gonna follow this river downstream now. That was, that was kind of right in about here where we took that picture and we're gonna keep going downstream until the river gets fat. So you see this wide part of the river is reservoir number one. And reservoir number one is formed by dam number one. So you'll see this curved concrete gravity dam. This dam was built in the 20s. So basically as Portland was growing, um, there was with more people, there was more water use and therefore a need for basically more water in the summertime. So still today, 125 you know, plus years of using this system, Still today, if we only had winter conditions, the Bull Run River all by itself without any storage could give us all the water we need and plenty more. So we only use about 20% of the water that comes down the Bull Run River. Now, granted, there's a lot of organisms and the ecosystem that needs the rest of that water. So that's great that we don't need it all because we can't have it, but, um, you know, it's those summer conditions that cause us to need to store water. Otherwise, we would not require storage like you see here in this picture. This big reservoir holds 10 million gallons of water when it's full. And if you see what I call the bathtub ring around it, that means that we've drawn some of the water out of it. So this is after we have started into summer a little bit and we've started taking some of that water and this will get lower and lower and lower over the course of the summer. Um, but if we didn't have summer, we wouldn't need it. We call ourselves water rich, but storage poor. We've got loads of water. The problem is it comes eight to nine months out of the year. And then we have very little water for the other three or four. And that's something that I think is pretty critical when uh, Matt and Reedy and I were talking in the beginning before everybody came on, that it's super important to understand place, which I know is something you all, um, you know, as part of the permaculture class, those of you that have done that or are doing that, um, that we talk about place because what what is needed from a water perspective is different depending on where you are and so our climate is such that we have loads of water and then we have almost no water and that's very different than somewhere that maybe has less water overall but it kind of is sparsed out you know parsed out periodically even through the summer like I lived in Colorado for a while and we get these massive rainstorms in the summertime even though it's really pretty arid there um, that doesn't happen in Portland. We, it's kind of all or nothing. So, um, so that might affect what people do from an irrigation standpoint, if you're, um, designing some kind of system. So 10 billion gallons of water, um, that's going to work its way through this dam. This dam just stores it and then we let it through and it rolls downstream right to the next reservoir. So now we're right here. Um, dam number two. So dam number two, sorry, this is kind of a fuzzy picture, but where my cursor is over here, this is actually the dam. So this is where the river used to run. And over here is actually a concrete spillway. So the other dam had the spillway right over the top of it, an earthen fill dam, which is what this one is, basically means it's made out of clay and rocks can't run the spillway over the top of it. So this is 7 billion gallons of water. So altogether, we store 17 billion gallons of water to help we store winter water so we have it in the summertime. So when summertime comes, I mean, essentially what I'm saying is that the biggest issue for us here in Portland is summer water, which, you know, is not super surprising, but it's really, it's, it's really different, our issues in the winter versus our winters in the summertime. And so being as efficient as we can with water in the summertime is really important because that is the time that, you know, 
we stop, basically we, we go from having a ton and not needing to do any watering at home um, because mother nature is doing that for us to having, you know, not a lot of water in the system and suddenly using twice as much. So that 80 million gallons a day I said we use every day in the winter can go as high as 160 million gallons a day. And that's actually pretty modest. When I started my job over 20 years ago, we used 200 million gallons a day. So the good news is we're getting really good at being efficient with water. We're getting much better at it. And I think we're gonna to continue to do that. And I'll tell you that even just like skipping over to somewhere like Lake Oswego, I've heard the folks running the water system down there, they, what they, this is what we call peaking, that we can double our water use in the summer. That's our peaking. They will quadruple. So we're talking lots of big lawns, lots of irrigation that maybe, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to judge how efficient it is, but um, anyways, that's that whole summertime. We have the least when we use the most. That's our crux right there. So um, most of our system, these dams, having more conduits, most of the infrastructure we have is designed to help take care of our needs in the summertime. Without summer, we would have the simplest, easiest water system you could imagine. So now we're right down here. We take that water as after dam number two, which we just saw, we're basically taking some of that water, I mentioned about 20% over the course of the year, taking it out of the system and putting it into this blue pipe. So before it goes into the pipe, we have to treat the water. So there are there is bacteria, there are viruses. And while there's not very much, and I probably as a healthy person risk, you know, risk it if I had the chance, but we have to treat that water to give it to you. So at this facility called Headworks, we'll see where it go. Okay, we basically put, this is an old picture. So this is now all grown in. This is not, um, this is after the construction of the dam, not right away, but um, so basically the water comes through the dam and then goes into these facilities here. And we are adding chlorine to the water, small amount, two to three parts per million is added to the water to disinfect bacteria um, and things that can make us sick. So some of the water's coming in here, getting the chlorine added, and then it has a trip of about 10 miles for that chlorine to do its disinfecting job um, through the pipes. The rest of the water is gonna come down over this dam, we call the diversion dam, and it's gonna run back down the stream and continue downstream to the Sandy River. So the water now has chlorine in it. It's going to take this path right here down to another facility called Lusted Hill. That is our secondary treatment where we are adding sodium hydroxide and ammonia. So chlorine by itself is really effective at disinfecting, but um, also is very volatile, wants to leave the system. And we have many, many miles to get it all the way over here to the farthest reaches of our system. So we add ammonia, chlorine and ammonia bond together to form what are called chloramines and those are more stable. And so a chloramine isn't as, effective at dis isn't as effective at disinfecting, that's a little mouthful, but, um, but that's why we give it the 10 minutes, I mean 10 minutes, sorry, 10 miles to um, do its disinfecting and then we stabilize it with ammonia. The sodium hydroxide is really important because our water tends to be, it doesn't have a lot in it. So it leans acidic and so, if you can think of an acid and what it might do to your pipes, it can eat away at your pipes. And so we want to make sure it is less likely to corrode your pipes, very specifically for the homes in Portland that may still, and Portland and our wholesale customers, that may still have lead solder connecting their pipes. So there are homes that have, up until um, 1985, it was legal to use lead solder to connect pipes. And it has been outlawed since then, but there is a period of time from about 1960 to 1985 where that was really common. And acidic water is going to leach potentially that lead out of your pipes and into your water. Now, the good news is, because that sounds super scary, the good news is that even if you have lead solder in your plumbing, two simple things 
can really help you to make sure that you aren't actually consuming that and you can still drink your tap water. And that is that you only ever drink or consume from the cold water tap, which is much less apt to leach. And if you've let your water sit for a good number of hours, just run the water for like a minute and let that flush out that water that's been sitting in the pipes. And those two things are going to really um, help reduce any risk of consuming lead. But um, that's something that we really want to make sure that our water isn't the cause of that leaching. So we adjust the pH from about seven to about eight currently in the 8.2. Um, we're also doing a project right now, um, in addition to the filtration project, that's going to what they're calling optimize that um, pH adjustment. So that's going to be changing a little bit in the next um, year and a half. So from here, the water is going to go downstream all the way to Powell Butte. So this is at the top of Powell Butte. We have two 50 million gallon tanks of water that are two of our major in-town storage reservoirs. And um, you can't really tell they're there if you're there, except for that there's big open grass land. Um, and we keep it that way specifically because the reservoirs are under there and we have to have access to it. But um, we've got storage at a high elevation, which thinking about Bull Run, the water at Headworks, um, so back here, the water starts at about 750 feet elevation. That water can get all the way from here, whoops, sorry, from, uh, from here all the way across to Washington Park, down across the Willamette River and up again by gravity. So Powell Butte is another piece of taking that water to a high elevation place. It may have to go down and up a lot before it gets there. But from there, we can use gravity again. So that makes us much more efficient, less, um, less use of energy to move water around the city. Um, so now, speaking of using energy, we do have to use a fair amount of energy to run groundwater. This is all water that's coming from 100 to 650 feet underground from those 25 wells we mentioned. It takes a lot of power to get that water up. But in an event that we have dirty water in Bull Run, which is not very common, or we don't have quite enough to make it through a dry summer season, we're really happy to have this groundwater. And this is all really high quality groundwater. We've got, um, like I mentioned, lots of monitoring wells that help us to monitor the water. And we have a really excellent groundwater protection program that works with the fire department to um, work with businesses. We and the fire department together work with businesses to make sure that their practices are good for groundwater quality. So um, groundwater is really critical to making sure we have water every day, every minute. Um, so groundwater is right here. This is the pump station. We've got 25 or so wells that pump to this pump station. And then it pushes the water up to Pell Butte. So as the crow flies, it doesn't have to go too far. But then, sorry about this. I keep skipping around when I'm cursing, cursoring. Um, so Pell Butte then um, is sort of the hub of the system where when we're using both, we have bull run runs to here and groundwater runs to here. And then to make it there, I realize this is sort of out of sequence, but the conduits, this is how water is traveling in one of three conduits that are 44 to 66 inches in diameter. These are the major highways for our water to bring water to town. Um, so now we've brought the water into town to Powell Butte and we have all around town some tanks and towers. There's about 77 of these. So once again, it's about getting high elevation water to distribute to neighborhoods. So we're taking, these high, taking advantage of these high elevation situations to be able to, again, use gravity to get water out to customers. And those are spread all over the city. Um, I already mentioned Washington Park. So water's going to, from Powell Butte Reservoirs, there's another reservoir here at Cully Butte up high. And we're currently replacing the two reservoirs that were at Washington Park with one underground tank. And that um, is the final large reservoir in the system. And then we pump up to the rest of the West Hills. Um, sorry about that skipping around, but then here you go, your water to your faucet. So I put up a little thank you card we got from one of our students on our field trip. And um, 
you know, I liked the mention that like what Brittany said, most grownups don't know already. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we tell students about on these field trips and, you know, like you all said in the beginning, there's a lot of things I don't know about my water system. So um, I really appreciate you making the time to learn about the water system today. And I know we've gotten, we're already almost at seven o'clock. So that went super fast. Um, I will stop sharing this and maybe we can, um, I realize that I stop sharing. There we go. There's a few questions in the chat. Oh, great. Okay. I can read out. Uh, how do you clean the groundwater system? Is there a massive tank in that Troutdale Reservoir? Um, let's see. So you mean the, are you talking about the, so cleaning the groundwater system is, do you mean cleaning the water or cleaning? Just, yeah. Are you just like adding chlorine to it? Just like you do up at okay. like above. Great question. Yeah. So groundwater, the interesting thing about groundwater is that we're going to build a filtration system for Bull Run and it's going to be kind of like groundwater, right? It's like sand and gravel and yep. groundwater is basically layers of sand and gravel and we pump the water out of it. So those groundwater aquifers are basically like filters. So we technically, because there's not organics in the ground, the way that there is in a living river system, we don't technically have to treat it the same way that we treat bull run water, but we do. And the reason that we do is that that blending of the bull run with the groundwater when the chemistry is really different is super complicated. And so we do the same thing. We treat with chlorine and then the ammonium sodium hydroxide. We don't necessarily have to do sodium hydroxide because the groundwater is a higher pH, more alkaline, and we can adjust a little bit just by the natural pH of the well water, but we, um, but we can if we need to. Okay, so the, so the well one? water is just like Columbia River, just like, it's just charging from the river, right? It's not just charging from the river. There's, um, you go hundreds of feet below the river. There's like right below the river is something called the Columbia River Sands. Um, aqua, I don't know if it's technically an aquifer, but it's, it, I guess it is an aquifer. And then below that, we have kind of a layer cake of aquifers. And we actually don't use the upper aquifer. We use the lower two aquifers. And then there's one called the Blue Lake Aquifer that's kind of below Blue Lake Park area. It's not connected to the lake, Blue Lake, but it's, you know, way below that general area. And so those are the aquifers we're pulling from. Okay. And those are not, I mean, they are recharged, right? By, I just, yeah. I just worry about, because I know the Columbia has, um, uh, you know, years of all of the oh. stuff that's been in it, all the road runoff and all that stuff. And I guess that does, would, would technically get filtered out but with a couple hundred feet of soil, but like you would think yeah. thumbs getting through and especially like radiation from, you know, that's the only thing I think from about Hanford. really. Yeah. Yeah. So here's one of the cool things about groundwater. And we actually do a whole class at some point, if you are ever interested, it's called groundwater 101 and you can come and we'll do like a whole, we bring all of our, our groundwater specialists and we talk in much more detail um, about groundwater, um, science, but essentially what's kind of cool about these aquifers is that these are the layers that were um, layers of rock, you know, from millions, you know, thousands and millions of years that have been that have essentially like Missoula flood layers and um, that have established the landscape that we have today. But basically they go, um, when is, my words are not working tonight, but basically they follow the geography of the land, which means it goes up towards the mountains, right? So where those rocks outcrop is up towards Mount Hood. It's out to the east. And so mm. where they outcrop is where they primarily recharge. And then it works because gravity is taking that water down, but it goes kind of horizontally um, instead of necessarily just going straight down from the river down. So there is some, there's a relationship between the river and the groundwater, but it's kind of the water. If you mentioned groundwater is coming from up here. Let me get rid of this. Yeah. But basically, if yeah, the I can from up here in the mountains, it. right? And then you've got gravity from the river, there's like a pressure dynamic, but it's not just like a flow in one direction. So it's sometimes the groundwater is discharging to the river, 
And then sometimes the groundwater is pushing down towards, I mean, the river is pushing down towards the aquifers, but it's not, it's not just flowing down. So. Okay, that, I'm convinced. Where is the, uh, where is this class taught? <laughs> oh, um, we usually do it. It's either in November or January and we put it on our website. And um, if anybody, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't, I think you just kind of have to, because we're not doing it right now, I can't tell you when, when we would be doing okay. it, but um, just with COVID, I, I don't even know what to, <laughs> what to say, but, um, but yeah, keep an eye out and definitely you can, um, you know, you can contact me at any point and just ask if we happen to be doing it. I'm happy to share my email. Um, let's see. Okay. So I totally want to honor it is 702. So if anybody, you know, is kind of done, you are welcome to go, but I am happy to answer more questions. Um, Let's see, was there anything else in the, okay, so we have Alpha, okay. And we are not using Mount Tabor anymore. Yeah, we have discontinued. We were, there was a long, and a bunch of you are in the Mount Tabor area, and so you're probably familiar with, there was a lot of conflict over the years about what to do about Mount Tabor, and we pushed back on the EPA for a long time and tried to figure out if there was a way to not, uh, what we, it was commonly referred to as covering the reservoirs, but, um, what ended up happening is there was just such a desire to keep those reservoirs functioning and, and looking the way that they look. Um, so meaning not turning them into an underground tank um, that we ultimately just went to Powell Butte, put those two, you know, put in an additional, there already was one up at Powell Butte. We put in a second reservoir there and then we did an upgrade to the Kelly Butte Reservoir. And those basically took the functional place of the Mount Tabor Reservoirs. So now the Mount Tabor Reservoirs are basically decorative and we supply water to them. We're trying to, um, you know, figure out how to, they're big, so they take a lot of water. And in the summertime, when we've got a lot of conflicting needs for water, it's not, um, it's not always easy to just make sure that we have fresh water in those reservoirs and standing water is a difficult thing for, um, you know, for mosquitoes and whatnot, you know, things, things grow in standing water as um, you guys know. So, um, so anyways, we're, we're working on that and that project that Reedy talked about as far as um, telling that indigenous story of water, um, there are also going to be signs that are, you know, kind of just telling some of the history of the water system and how it used to work and how it works today. Um, so, but they are kind of being kept there as historic features. Um, let's see. So I did want to, we have a really robust water efficiency program and they do commercial water efficiency programs and you know, residential um, water efficiency programs. We have water efficiency, water conservation kits that can be sent out that's, you know, kind of indoor water devices and, um, and also kind of some gardening types of options. So low flow is a real focus. Um, we spend a lot of time, we have incentives for things like toilet replacements. The biggest water use in your home is your toilet. And depending on how old your toilet is, it could use a lot of water if it's not a newer one. So the difference between the really old, like five gallon flushes and the new 1.28 to you know 0.9 is a big difference. So replacing your toilet can really help you out in reducing water demand. Um, that, that whole, the thing I mentioned about how our water demand has gone down over the years, people are usually really surprised by that. Our population has not gone down but our water demand has, and that is, you know, a trend nationwide. So, you know, kudos to all the amazing engineers who have designed, you know, new kinds of devices and um, our plumbing code has changed to make us more efficient. Um, there, are, there are other reasons that our demand has dropped. And some of that is that we have wholesale customers that are deciding to go to other water sources. So they, you know, may have water rights to, you know, the, um, Let's see, so who is, I'm, I'm mixing up who on the west side has rights to the Willamette, like Tualatin Valley Water District is eventually going to stop using Bull Run and they are going to develop water off of the Willamette River. And so there are people who are, 
you know, basically wanting to exercise their water rights. And so what that means is that as Portland grows, you know, there is a lot of water available that we're not, we're not quite as worried as a lot of parts of even the region, but definitely other parts of the country. We're pretty privileged. Um, one of you mentioned that, you know, we have a lot of water here and you're right that there are lots of things to worry about um, regarding water, but we are very, very lucky here because this groundwater bull run, um, these complementary systems, we are very confident about having enough water for decades into the future. Um, we are doing a lot to think about, Reedy mentioned, um, you know, sort of climate justice and we have essentially, you know, really the, I think the thing that the Water Bureau is doing is recognizing that the, um, the people who have been historically sort of most impacted by environmental challenges, you know, environmental problems, um, that our job is to put effort into um, making sure our impact on climate is less over the years because we recognize that as an equity issue. Um, so there's a lot of things that um, that we're doing that range from you know how we're thinking about our employees that we have. Um, you know we've got a lot of employees who work outdoors, and a lot of those employees it happens to be just like it is in many other parts of the world where BIPOC people um, are more impacted by some of those challenges. And so, um, so making sure that we're addressing those needs, um, that we're thinking about, you know, what wildfire smoke and extreme heat and, you know, how we're adapting to those and having strategies for our workers. Um, so we're, you know, we're doing things with just efficiencies of all kinds, whether it's like, you know, electric vehicles and trying to transition to more of that, um, get off of our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, so it's, you know, and then it's trying to make sure that we're equitably, um, I see that Sean took off, thanks for coming. Um, Mount Tabor, the cell towers add more radiation to the water as well. Glad you know that was oh, I couldn't speak to that, but. Um, so um, let's see, okay. I. I'd rather just, if anybody has anything, any last things, I realize I have way too many things that I'm trying to shove into this very short period, but um, maybe Reedy, you can tell me if there's one of your questions that I just didn't get to and you'd really like me to address. Definitely if somebody else has a question. Um, what else? I guess, well, I guess like, you know, into the future, is there something that you're excited about in terms of, or maybe even just speaking more broadly to the concept that we talked about, the watershed stewardship, like how, you know, how, yeah, just speaking to the concept of watershed, watershed stewardship and how people can become more um, involved in our watershed and protecting it. And also in terms, you brought up water rights and, you know, indigenous people. So I have all these things and I'm like, yeah, so how do you, yeah. together, you know, because um, I'm also thinking about Yakima and, you know, people on the res who, you know, I know that there's mutual aid drives where they don't have running water. And so it's not just globally that people don't have water coming out of their faucets, but, you know, the indigenous people on this land itself don't have water, running water sometimes. So, yeah, I just have these thoughts in my head and like, how are we moving towards a more um, water just future? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, about a million directions to possibly go in that. But um, yeah, it makes me think about um, the Warm Springs, you know, have been particularly challenged in the last few years. And, you know, that's been something that's been really nice that the Water Bureau has, you know, I mean, comparatively, we have a ton of resources and we have been able to build these emergency, um, you know, like, what are we doing in an emergency? So, you know, we're building up supplies 
to be able to deal with different, any kind of emergency, whether it's the, you know, catastrophic earthquake or whatnot. So we were able to, you know, deliver equipment to the Warm Springs when they were in a boil water notice and did not have water for their communities. We have a lot of, you know, we have lots of our operations folks and engineers who run this really pretty big system comparatively. So we're able to offer, um, you know, support and expertise to some of these smaller water systems like some of these reservations. Um, I think there's probably a whole lot more we can do. And, you know, we're, we're working on figuring out how to do that. We have a new, um, new, I shouldn't say new, but um, about three years now, we've had a tribal relations program. So it's pretty new. And we have a um, director and now one new staff person in that program. And it's been super exciting. I have the privilege of being the liaison for the Water Bureau to that program. And it's, it feels, you know, it feels slow because everything takes a lot of time and we're a bureaucracy and, you know, and we're all learning um, and unlearning. I'm finding more than anything unlearning, but, um, but we're just trying to, you know, take steps to figure out, you know, what do we not know about what some of these communities and community members, like, you know, what do people need and what um, we're doing a really cool, we're, we're calling it our urban indigenous engagement circle. And we've, um, we've hired six native people to advise us about our filtration project. And, you know, and one of the pieces of that is we're paying them. We're not assuming that you should come talk to us and tell us what you care about, you know, out of the good of your heart, because like somehow we, you know, you owe that to us. It's, um, you know, we're paying them decent money to give us advice and give us feedback and, you know, maybe tell us where we're not doing okay. And so, um, so that's been really neat to, you know, to, um, learn from those folks and and honestly what i'm learning is you know they're super proud of our water system and you know feel connected to that too but we're having some interesting conversations like oh wait i see why that land is really strategic but that was also my tribe's you know land for harvest um or you know for passage to where you know where when we used to i don't know do some do a vision quest or um travel to see you know neighboring or neighboring people um anyways and so you know just talking about access talking about um i read an article recently about fortress conservation so i'm having to face what it means to be an environmentalist and um, you know that there's there's kind of this idea that like oh we have to love to protect it and that's very different than just the fun land and um and so you know this is some of my um Figuring out where my colonialism and um, so and I'm going all kinds of directions, but um, let's see. Get me back on reading what um, or if anybody else anything else. Yeah, I don't know if, if you're breaking up for everyone else, um, but you're breaking up a bit. Thumbs off. Of uh, okay. My Wi-Fi, can you hear me? Yes. Now? Is it can you hear my you? My Wi-Fi might not be so great right now for some reason. Yeah. You got me back? Yeah, I think we can hear you, but okay. your image is um, frozen, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's no. The worst. I, I'm seeing a question here about structure. No replacement filters. No maintenance. No added chemicals or salt. Natural water Um, I'm not sure. Do you, I know structures for what purpose? 
See if you're still there. Maybe for, maybe she's talking about filtering or something like that. Yeah, Marilyn, I think Briggy's asking yeah. more clarity around what do you mean by structured water units? For which purpose? Maybe, maybe Marilyn's doing something else, I'm not sure. Um, but if there's any like other that. questions, um, yeah. Oh, for cleaning. Oh, for water. cleaning water and naturally adding more oxygen. Thanks, Nancy. I mean, if you're talking about for our drinking water system, um, you know, that's a big question. Uh, I think sometimes things that, you know, thinking about something that can work on a small scale is different than what can work on a large scale, but that also may be, you know, I, I don't think I'm, I may not know enough about it to, like, I, I know a little bit about, you know, what do they call them, like living, um, um, you know, like natural, using plants to clean water and like all that is amazing. And it's just how to do that for a million people, I think is a, um, is another, it's it's sort of the, the tension of like economies of scale versus when you've got so many people in a small space, how do you, you know, how do you serve the needs for all of those people? So, um, so anyways, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of amazing, I'm really interested in all these ideas of, I don't pretend to know a lot about permaculture, but, um, but I think there's a lot of, um, things that align really nicely with, um, you know, things like water efficiency that like these resources are important and we need to use them wisely. Um, we have to think about them, not just as something that we get to exploit. It's, um, I know there's a big, there's a big focus on soil, right? For permaculture. And that's really, I mean, that's like our water efficiency team would love to talk to you about soil because, um, there's, you know, there's a lot to being more efficient that soil can help with. So they would love that part. There's, um, I do think there's a misconception in Portland in particular that like, we need rain barrels, we need to collect water in rain barrels. And that whole no water in the summer thing makes rain barrels really hard. So your investment, I think I was told like, you buy a rain barrel, you'll make your money back in 75 years. So, you know, that may just not be the best irrigation for our location here, but, um, but that doesn't mean, you know, makes you happy, then do it. It's an incremental help. So lots of, there's just lots of different things. Um, and I know you guys are designing these systems and I don't know what they're made up of. And, um, you know, our, our mechanical engineer said, you know, you could talk to them about, you know, making sure that their, their system's not leaking, you know, keep in mind, like how to track, there's some like smart meters that can help you know if you have a leak or not. Those are things that, you know, can be really useful if you're designing these systems and you want to um, understand how to make them the most efficient. But anyways, lots of, there's some people that would love to get into the weeds with you on that if you're interested. The literal. I have a last question for you. <laughs> so I'm like bugging you. But like, you know, in terms of what people can do, like, are there a few recommendations you have? Like, because especially since the, like you're saying, the rainwater bar barrels are kind of like, I've heard people use them more just to have a connection to water source, which yeah. is an educational opportunity and other things just to yeah. bring that, that presence and mindfulness. But mm -hmm. if you're really looking at reducing the water um, what I don't know, you wouldn't call it a footprint. I don't know the the splash print. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, what are some ways in which in an urban in Portland people can can be more water wise? Um, I think the really biggest thing is outdoor irrigation because summertime, like I mentioned, it's summertime, right? And so what happens is that whole using more water, what do they say we use 55% of our water inside our houses, we use 45% of our water outside of our houses, but this 55% is 12 months. 
this 45% is just, you know, three to four. So we're using a lot in this little period of time. So the more you can be efficient about that, the better off. So like, you know, lots of, you know, just our water conservation and water efficiency group puts out a lot of stuff about like, don't just run your sprinkler and not have it on a timer. Don't like there are a lot of simple things, but and people not knowing how much they need to water. And I think I think native plants are a huge part of it. The more that we can use native plants, the more you're looking at plants that are used to living here and they don't need, you know, they're adapted to not getting that water all summer once they're established. And so, you know, so big hit on native plants. Is, I mean, um, it's, it really is that outdoor, it's that outdoor water use, um, you know, and then, you know, get a efficient toilet. If you don't have one, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good thing. And, and all these things, frankly, I mean, unfortunately our bill is getting more expensive. The more and more we have regulatory drivers that make us need to do these improvements to our system, it costs money. And so anything that you can do to bring your water use down is going to help you reduce the bill. Um, we do, we are pushing a lot to, um, what I meant to say earlier is that during COVID, this has become even more important, but um, has always been important, is making sure that we have a financial system program that can make sure that the most vulnerable parts of our population are not worried about whether or not they have water coming out of the tap. And um, so there's a lot of interesting conversations about how to do that because historically it's been older white people that take advantage the most of that financial assistance program. And so we're trying to change that. So we make sure that people know that it exists. We have lots of different financial assistance, forms of financial assistance. And during COVID, we had a specific program of like $1.6 billion that got put out to, I think 87% BIPOC owned businesses. It was to support small owned businesses with their utility bills during COVID. And so that was a really cool process that, um, you know, really, um, collaborated with the, um, what's it called? The coalition of chamber, chamber of color, chamber coalition of chambers of color. So it's, you know, like the Oregon or the, um, Native American chamber and the Asian Pacific Islander, all the business, um, uh, support anyways, worked with them to make sure that those small businesses, um, we could give some support to some of those small businesses that are so struggling right now. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I could just keep going. So I'm gonna let you guys call it. Matt, did you wanna ask one more question? Ricky, if you, if you want. Sure, and we could follow up on this too. I was curious since the um, toilet is one of the biggest water users, uh, what's the Water Bureau's position on compost toilets? You know, I don't know that that would really be a water bureau, um, you know, position to have because I think it's more about, um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, it's more about like the Bureau of Environmental Services might care about that more. Like, so we're the water bureau and then the Bureau of Environmental Services is the sewer stormwater side of things. And so, but I think a composting toilet doesn't, Right, like it's not affecting the the sewage system, is it? No, I mean it would be keeping it's all right there. Right? And also not using all the flushing. And so seeing that uh, having a, a compost system could really greatly re reduce your water usage. I think it would be that would be more of a city code thing, right? Is what does the city um, I'll have to ask about that because I think um, again this also gets into that like massive scale right of like if every single person ran their own i think some of this stuff is you know is governments and systems saying can we trust people to do this right and that's um you know that's a different discussion we could have but um but you know i think there's um I, you know, I don't know how much it costs, how hard it is to, you know, to operate them, to maintain them. Um, I do know that, so I have a place 
I um, was lucky enough to get to, I grew up in Wisconsin on, you know, swimming in lakes and I really miss lakes. And I found this cute little 1904 cabin down like towards Coos Bay. It's on a lake. I have no potable water. I have to take a boat to get to this little place. And I have the most amazing, after 20 some years of working for the Water Bureau and I always appreciated my water. I now really appreciate my water because I have to lug in my drinking water and I have to fix my water system when it breaks. And it is expensive to run these things, right? It's expensive to, if you have to deal with a septic tank or, you know, so I think it's kind of about weighing like how, you know, what would the cost be to people, to every single person, um, you know, what are, I don't know. There's, there's just a ton of questions there. So I don't know that the city has a thing against composting toilets, but I don't know. So I'm going to ask our, I'm going to ask our water efficiency folks, they'd be the most likely to know. Yeah, I'm um, aware that there was an effort in the last 10 years to legalize uh, compost toilets. There's like certain parameters around how to do it, of course. I was just right. curious, it could be a, a pretty major water saving strategy, like with the uh, Water Bureau. Um, right. Things to say about it as an option for reducing the water. Uh, yeah, I wonder if we would like incentivize that, right? If that would be something that we would get into, because we incentivize you replacing your toilets, we will pay right? Like you can get 50 bucks to get a low flush toilet. So um, yeah, I'm going to ask them what they think about it. There's some really, you would be amazed. We have conversations about urinals and toilets and there's well, I can imagine. <laughs> lots of conversations. Waterless urinals are a big topic, which I can't pretend to be an expert about, but it's surprisingly controversial. Um, and yeah, I'll, no, that's a good question. I like to, I love to talk shit. Oh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is the urine diversion based toilets as well, like not even getting into poop, but yes, uh, or, you know, it's still a form. Yeah. Anyway, so there's just different, different like parts of the system that can, that can kind of disinvest from using water to flush. Um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention something, Briggy, before we hop up, hop off, is that you know the financial assistance, any other like incentives for people um, that you know of, like you know just any kind of material, like a packet, especially for our folks who are local, um, mm -hmm. like a resource kit or something like that. We'd be happy to share out, um, and then of course, you know, um, like there's. Like I mentioned, we are connected to some folks who know a lot about water, know like there's a city coded human use system, like composting toilet system um, at one of the places that we frequent or like, you know, do have like used as a class demonstration site. And so we're connected to people who are, um, who are water wise and in different ways. And so would love to continue the conversation and collaboration and and bring the pieces together to yeah to work together so yeah, and the folks who who uh successfully put through the um, effort to legalize uh, compost toilets and the gray water usage for the state it's really exciting yeah because that's been a really big i know that's a really big deal and it's um yeah i mean i think there's so many good uses for that you know those different ideas and it's just there's it's all you know it's all mixed in that like knowing what works for place and you know how to how to maximize our um, all of our investments as a community um so i can send you the i believe there is a i think there's something on our website or else i can connect you to the person but we have water conservation kits that we send out to our customers um, there's lots of different, um, you know, there's, um, let's see, we have, I mean, we've got leak repair, you know, like we'll assist people with leak repair. If you have, um, if, you know, qualified based, you have to be qualified based on income and you have to be the homeowner, but we can help people repair toilet leaks, faucet leaks, outdoor spigot leaks, um, leaks in wall pipes all kinds of things like that. So there's um, services like that. And then again, we've got, you know, incentives for different kinds of, um, you know, changing different, changing out different systems that we've got. Um, and then we'll just send, you know, we send people like toilet diverter, um, little toilet diverter things that help make sure that your 
toilet doesn't, you know how the water, this is like, I'm not gonna be able to describe how it works, but you know, when you refill the toilet tank, it sends a certain amount of water to fill the toilet and you can divert some of that so that it uses less to fill it up. Cause some of it, I think goes down the drain, you know, continues down the drain. Um, and so it's got that there's a, you know, sometimes it's a shower head that's low water use shower head, faucet aerators, um, garden hose, nozzles, thing like that. Um, a shower timer, five minute shower timer. So um, those are all free for our customers. So anyone who wants to request those, you can definitely get those, find out what different incentives we are offering right now. Um, Just getting some requests to be able to share this with more oh, yeah. people. Yeah. And, um, and I'm assuming that you're fine, like, you know, I, it's just a resource yeah. that, that we've recorded it and we'd love to, you know, um, share this with people and then maybe here's a good point to um, exit out of the recording. So I'll just say this is Briggy Thomas from the Water Bureau. Um, I think that I'm assuming since you work with the city, it would be Briggy, B-R-I-G-G-Y dot, dot Thomas, uh, Thomas. Yeah, T-H-O-M-A-S. Yep. Mm -hmm. So look, Briggy. Oh, here, why don't I just, you want me to put it in here? Sure. And um, so you can look at look that up, look Briggy yep. up, and there's uh, my. That's the yeah. Pack. And if you go to the water bureaus, you can go to the city of Portland. Just you know, put in the um, we're Portland.gov for the city, and then search on water. You can find the water bureau. We have a whole education program section that um, has information about you know the tours that when they happen again, we will be offering and you can get on the list to um, be notified when we start doing those again. So you can actually right now go on and put yourself on a list and then we'll be getting in touch with people when we are so fortunate to get to do that again, which I hope is not too far away. Great. Thank you, Ricky. <laughs>